All right. So we'll be having an interview session with our third speaker. And it's also in the same lines. We'll be speaking about financing in the renewable energy space. And Adam Fitzwilliam is the regional manager for East Africa at Camco Clean Energy, where he supports the origination and execution of transactions across the region, in addition to wider business development activities to the, of the company. He's also the head of the Camco Spark flat platform, which was set up in 2021 to catalyze the growth of the Sub-Saharan Africa's energy efficiency and distribution of renewable energy sectors. He's based out of Nairobi. I hope that's where you're coming to us from, Adam. Sometimes he's based in London. I am, yep. But Okay, excellent. So let's uh, let us welcome Adam with a hearty, hearty clap. Thank welcome, you. Adam. We have a number of people here physically, and then we have some online. So you'll be speaking to both audiences, and I'll be asking you some questions. No problem. So I'd like I'd like you to maybe introduce the uh, Camco Energy and the Spark platform and what you do there and what the Spark platform does. Okay, thanks Lena, and thanks um, to the Innovators and World Energy Day team for having me. I'm going to try hard to match your energy, Lena. <laughs> Thank um, you. So let's keep this energy high. Uh, so yeah, good morning everyone and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak this morning. Uh, as Lynette kindly uh, introduced, my name is Adam Fitzwilliam. Uh, I'm a regional manager for East Africa at Camco Clean Energy. Uh, for those who don't know who Camco is, uh, we're a climate and impact fund manager specializing on effectively decarbonization um, in emerging markets. Um, we were established in Kenya in the late 80s. Uh, so we've been around a long time. Not myself personally, I was not doing much professional uh, in the late 80s, but uh, some of my colleagues were. <laughs> uh, and since inception, we've um, uh, supported over 1.6 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, globally and uh, crowded in over 3.6 billion US dollars into the clean energy space. So um, yeah, fairly long uh, track record and experience in the, in the space. Um, in terms of the uh, platforms that we manage, there are two main ones that we invest in Sub-Saharan Africa. The first one is called uh, the Renewable Energy Performance Platform, or REPP, uh, which is a $200 million um, platform which was funded by the UK government uh, as part of its uh, commitments to support decarbonization uh, on the continent. Uh, we've been investing the REP uh, facility since 2016. I think we've made north of 45 uh, investments, both debt and equity, uh, in sectors such as IPPs, um, mini grids, and solar home systems. Um, and that's across sub Saharan Africa, with a few exceptions, uh, like South Africa and Namibia, and a couple of others. Um, and the second one that we uh, manage is the, the Spark platform, which is the one that's probably more relevant for today. Uh, which is effectively targeted at um, financing uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency projects uh, in five countries initially in sub-Saharan Africa, including uh, Kenya and Uganda in East Africa, as well as South Africa, uh, Nigeria and Ghana in other parts of the continent. Um, through Spark, we look to provide up to 100% financing for new uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that are specifically focused on helping um, commercial and industrial uh, companies with decarbonization, reducing costs, and increasing the uh, quality of power. So in a nutshell, that's who we are, and uh, I look forward to the discussion today. Back to you, Lena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. I saw people sit up when you said 100% financing. 
<laughs> I think I think that's interesting for 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 people in the room. Thank you for that introduction about what you do. What are some of the greatest strides that Africa has made in terms of renewable energy in the last five years, uh, based on your experience in the industry? Yeah, thanks. So I think um, if I could summarize a couple, maybe with a couple of examples, I think in the IPP space, so in the uh, grid connected project space, we see some really, really innovative and first of kind transactions. Um, I can give a couple of examples from the rep portfolio that we manage. So for example, in Burundi, uh, we uh, helped finance the first uh, IPP project in Burundi since independence. Uh, it's an 8.7 megawatt peak uh, solar PV project in Burundi. Uh, and it is now contributing roughly 15% of the total installed capacity of the country. So that was really a, a groundbreaking uh, project we were involved in. Uh, and I think it was one of the largest, if not the largest, private sector investments in Burundi uh, in many, many years. Um, another good example is uh, uh, in the IPP space is um, the Mwenga uh, wind farm, which is a 2.1 uh, megawatt wind project uh, in the Mwenga region in Tanzania that we uh, financed with uh, Rift Valley Energy. That was the first um, uh, wind, wind IPP in the country, uh, and it effectively feeds into a rural distribution network. So along with the hydro on the same network is providing 100% renewable energy to a rural distribution network. Um, so those are a couple of examples from the IPP space. If I can move to the, uh, to the mini grid space, we started to see some great proof of concept uh, projects and the scale up of some of these rural electrification programs. A couple I can mention, PowerGen, who are based here in Kenya, who are doing some fantastic work at uh, scaling up rural electrification, both in East Africa and increasingly uh, across the continent. Um, and also the, the Nuru team based in DRC, uh, who are doing solar um, battery mini grids, which are covering entire cities, right? So DRC is a very, very huge um, country. And so, uh, the ability to connect 100% of the population through the national grid is going to be a colossal challenge, right? So some of these regional distribution grids are a very, very interesting innovation uh, and a very uh, cost-effective way of providing, you know, renewable energy access to large uh, population centers. And then maybe lastly, in the in the CNI space or commercial and industrial space, we're really starting to see um, some some momentum, right? I think, unfortunately, as some of the, the challenges with grid power have bitten, for example, in South Africa, you know, the ongoing challenges with ESCOM, Nigeria, there's also a lot of challenges around power reliability. It's really creating opportunities to innovate in the, uh, in the space. And effectively, through renewable energy, which is typically the cheapest and uh, um, obviously lowest carbon solutions, you know, be able to provide affordable and, and um, low carbon power to industrial entities, therefore, you know, significantly re reducing their operating risk, but also helping them with their path towards net zero and their own sustainability goals. So if I could summarize, I think we've seen, you know, over the last five years, some really, really interesting individual projects and, and significant momentum being brought into the sector. I think what we now need to see is how do we scale that up? How do we make it more efficient? How do we how do we ensure that that's you know these projects are not the exception but the norm, and really streamline the approach so we can massively scale up the sector and uh, meet some of these energy access and sustainable energy targets we have. Okay, amazing. Uh, we can see that Africa is is really going to be lighting up. You know, Dr. Anna showed us a picture of dark the dark continent yesterday, and we said no to that. And from Adam, we can hear that there are different projects that uh, are coming up for renewable energy. I met Adam a few months ago, and he'd come from DRC, and he was just telling me about that project that they have there. And he was saying how it has empowered the community there 
yeah a community that was just sitting around not doing anything but once they put up the 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 renewable energy small businesses started popping up some productive use of energy was there so we can see that we can empower our own people once we get the power to them all right you mentioned energy efficiency adam and and it's often overlooked when it comes to implementing energy projects why is it we need to push for the implementation of energy efficiency projects together with uh, renewable energy ones? Yeah, thanks, Lena. Um, look, I think there have been some significant and quite uh, well-published wins in the solar sector. And I think as a result of that, there's been a, a little bit of a rush to solar, let's say, in the continent. Um, and you can see that particularly in Kenya, but in other jurisdictions as well, South Africa, et cetera. And look, I, I think that's a fantastic um, trend. And it's certainly not one I'm looking to uh, uh, critique. But what I would say is that solar has some limitations. So for example, clearly it only generates electricity when the sun is shining. So that is uh, inherently limited to, let's say 12 hours or, or maybe eight good hours a day. Whereas particularly if you're looking at, you know, the actual consumption of power, it's, it's 24 hours. And particularly when you look at some of the industrial and manufacturing companies, they're often running shifts that uh, run more or less 24 hours. So I think the first point to make is that solar cannot on its own address 100% of the energy needs of uh, companies or even countries. I think second second thing to point out is that um, we think that the sector needs a slightly more holistic approach to energy management. So for us, the key is understanding exactly the existing consumption of consumers, particularly CNI consumers, and really understanding how they're using electricity uh, across the days, months, you know, what are the patterns? Uh, and, you know, even on a more granular basis, what specific machinery is contributing, uh, you know, to specific energy consumption? And then once we have a picture of that, um, generally the lowest cost um, and uh, shortest payback interventions are actually in the energy efficiency space, right? So it typically makes sense to do this work, do this kind of heavy lifting, fully understand the energy consumption patterns of, of companies, and first look at what we can reduce because the uh, kilowatt hours not consumed are the cheapest, uh, in short. Uh, and then once we've reduced the overall consumption of uh, consumers, only then do we look to uh, reduce the reliance on the grid uh, and reduce the emissions from the grid through things like on-site renewable energy. But to be honest, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that can happen first um, before solar is implemented. And what it also means is that generally you'll, you'll be implementing a smaller um, solar array which means that you know ultimately you're not spending unnecessary capex on a on a system that is too large, and actually you're first reducing your consumption and then right sizing your solar whatever whatever uh, generation source you have to uh, basically offset the residual energy demand. Right. Thank you for that. I think we can see why. Uh, we need to have energy efficiency so that we are able to meet the demand uh, for for energy and be able to conserve what we are able to produce. So I, we hear a lot about the term bankable projects in financing, and I, I know people in the room have heard about this. Could you tell us what this means for for you as a financier and for people who are looking to have their projects financed? Yeah, I think you're right to raise this. I think um, unhelpfully bankable is a bit of a uh, imprecise term. And I think it means different things to different financiers. So if you're a developer uh, like innovators and I'm sure others in the room, uh, it can be quite challenging to, to really put their finger on what bankable is. Right? So in the absence of a clear definition, I'm happy to share what uh, bankable means to me. <laughs> and that's effectively just having you know credible parties uh, with a solid track record in their specific field, uh, implementing uh, the task that they are, you know, most 
um, capable of doing and also taking on the risks that they are most capable of taking on. So again, that's probably a bit generic. So if I can um, drill down on it, uh, if you're looking at a, a project for a CNI customer, it could be a fantastic customer, you know, been around for 200 years, immensely profitable. Let's say it's a Safaricom type customer, right? So they have the credibility, they have the track record, we have a good sense that they'll be around for a long time. However, if um, a technical provider who is inexperienced either in the region or in the technology comes along and designs a project that is not fit for purpose, then that project will still not be bankable. Um, even if we're dealing with a bankable uh, off-taker, right? And similarly, you could have a, a great company like Innovators with track record and uh, experience in the space, but they decide to do a project with uh, a company that is defaulting on all its obligations. You know, the bank is knocking on the door. So you've got the technical experience and the credibility on the, on the project side, but ultimately you've got a, a counterparty or a client that is not credible, right? And so the, the key point uh, of ascertaining bankability is making sure that you have credible parties on each side. Uh, you're making sure that, for example, the technical provider is taking the technical risk on the project. The financier is, is taking on you know, most of the financial risks. You've got lawyers taking on the, the, you know, the legal drafting of contracts and making sure that through those contracts, you're effectively allocating risk in an optimal manner. Whether, whether the party that is best placed to take that risk is able to do so. So if I can summarize, that's, that's my perception of bankability, but I think um, you're right to point out that it's a bit of a, a elusive term. And so uh, <laughs> I'm happy to take others' views as well. And also maybe there's a discussion around that uh, later in the session. Okay, so what I hear is uh, bankability is not a one shoe fits all. It depends on the different partners who come into the project, the financier, the implementer, and the owner of the project. So thank you for clarifying that. And, and sometimes organizations are a bit skeptical about the ESCO model. And we've heard about the ESCO model where you get a project implemented without, no, without financial initial financial costs, and you can pay back through your savings. Could you let us know a little more about this model and how it works and if it's, it has different ways of working or it's just this one way of working? Adam? Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I think they're right to be skeptical. <laughs> I think there's a very, few, very few examples of um, business models like the ESCO one. Um, where effectively, if you're a customer, you're being asked to spend no capex on a brand new solution. Um, you're not required to raise financing. Um, and effectively, you can actually save uh, money on your bills from day one, despite having not invested in anything or financed anything yourself. So I think... Um, uh, I agree with you, Lynette. There's a lot of skepticism in the market, and I think with good reason. But what I would say is that um, this is one of those uh, rare business models where it really is um, a pretty compelling business case, right? So with the ESCO model, you have a, a technical implementation of the project, which is also fully financed generally, um, which means that effectively the ESCO provider can take away all of, the, all of the pain points really from the end user or the customer in this scenario, they can implement the project, they can insure it, they can carry out the operations and maintenance, and they can even finance it. And depending on what uh, savings can be made through the energy efficiency and any generation proposals uh, of the ESCO, it can be that there really is zero cost uh, to, the, to the end user and that they effectively recoup, um, the ESCO recoups the cost of the, the finance and the CapEx and the insurance and the o &M, et cetera, through monthly uh, payments, which are lower than the equivalent utility bill. So uh, understand why people are skeptical. I think it's our job in, this, in the sector to explain exactly how it works. 
and to evidence where we can through proof of concepts and examples um, that this isn't theory, this is actually uh, something that is being implemented today in Kenya and on the continent and elsewhere globally for, for some time. Uh, and to get uh, customers comfortable with some of these concepts, um, because it really, you know, in most scenarios, uh, it does make a lot of sense for customers. Um, and it really is a, a kind of win-win for, for all parties. All right. Thank you for demystifying that. And I'm sure uh, if you have any other questions, you could reach out to Adam about how the ESCO model works and also the team from Innovators because we are an ESCO and we are able to also tell you how the model works. I, I'd like, I understand, we have a partnership. I'm wearing my Innovators hats uh, with the Camco Spark platform. And it's, it is one that offers financing for energy projects. Adam, could you let us know a little bit about this and the kind of projects that we are collaboratively working on at the moment? So I'm happy to start off, but I also want to get you involved um, because uh, you're also, uh, if not more so, an expert in this field. Um, <laughs> but in summary, the, the nature of our partnership is, um, uh, so through our Spark platform, which I briefly des described earlier, uh, we've created uh, an ESCO with the Innovators team. So Lynette, Linda, Chris, who I've all seen in the room and, uh, uh, and some others. And the idea is that Innovators is our technical partner uh, and we are their financing partner. And so Innovators um, has experience in energy audits, they have experience in implementation of uh, what we call energy conservation measures, which are effectively just uh, energy efficiency interventions. Um, as well as uh, carrying out renewable energy uh, on site. And so the idea is that uh, Innovators effectively is responsible for the technical implementation of the project. Uh, we are the financing partner, which means we're able to provide the energy efficiency and renewable energy equipment free of charge effectively to the customer. Uh, and then we effectively look to recoup the, the cost of our investment and our financing through a monthly service charge, an ESCO charge with the end users, which as I mentioned earlier, is generally set at a price which is lower than the equivalent uh, utility tariff. So for the customer, they get to outsource their energy, um, you know, the implementation of energy projects, which is generally uh, and not a core part of their, their business. Um, for innovators, they're able to do the technical implementation and op operate and maintain the projects over the life of the project. And for Spark, we're able to fully finance it and uh, get repaid over a period of typically uh, five years uh, through these ESCO payments, which, as I mentioned, uh, the sets are uh, typically at a lower price than the utility tariff. Um, so in a nutshell, that, that's our ESCO model. I don't know if, Lynette, you want to say a few words uh, more on the innovative side. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just the, the simple financier. It's you guys doing the hard work. Uh, yes, you give us a lot of credit. Uh, indeed, we, we take care of the technical implementation of the project and we also source for the projects here in Kenya. And so if you would like a little more information, you could visit our website as well as talk to our team. Linda, please wave to the crowd. Linda is our expert in ex escos and, and she can tell you a little more about that. So our last question from me, but we can take other questions from the audience, is uh, there are new and emerging areas of uh, in the energy industry. And we can see a lot of talk about e-mobility, carbon trading, green hydrogen, and we got to hear about this yesterday. Are these some areas that the Spark platform is considering to get into in terms of financing, Adam? Yeah, thanks. So um, for sure, look, it's a very exciting space and uh, it moves very, very quickly. Um, I think in the e-mobility space in particular, in the last 18 months to two years, we've seen a huge amount of, uh, you know, startups and entrepreneurs into the space doing everything from battery swap for bodo bodders to tuk-tuks to matatus to uh, 
yeah, really kind of localized uh, solutions to the to the East African market. Again, I'd say we're in the early stages. These are very much proof of concept projects. Um, and we look forward to seeing how these companies grow. I think the, the good news is we're starting to see some institutional money uh, flow into this space, which will give some of these companies the ability to grow and scale and really, um, you know, scale their impact. Um, from the Camco side, uh, we have invested via our rep facility in one company which does um, electric mobility, um, a company called Mobile Power, uh, which is primarily uh, in West Africa, but rapidly expanding into Central and East Africa. But effectively, they started by doing battery swap for energy access. So effectively providing renewables powered um, batteries to end users so they can charge things like mobile phones, lighting, all this stuff. Um, but they've really in, uh, innovated into the uh, e-mobility space with much larger battery swap for things like tuk-tuks and bikes, and also for generator replacement, right? So particularly in areas where um, uh, the grid is less reliable. I think we're in general quite lucky here in Kenya that we have pretty good grid reliability, but that's certainly not the case uh, across the continent. Um, where you can actually use uh, e-mobility style solutions for, for generator replacement, right? And using uh, lithium ion batteries uh, to kick in when, when the grid effectively uh, fails. So yeah, we, we started to double. Um, I think through Spark as well, particularly in countries where there's a very high penetration of renewable energy in the grid. So Kenya is a great example here. I think more than 90% on a kilowatt hour basis uh, of grid electrons are renewable. Then, you know, we're very interested in uh, e-mobility and electric uh, bikes and things like this, because effectively it is an efficiency play. You're displacing 100% fossil fuel, you know, combustion engines with almost 100% renewable energy uh, from the grid or from solar. So definitely uh, an area that we're interested in through Spark. In the carbon credit space, um, so uh, a little fact, so CAMCO actually stands for Carbon Asset Management Company. Um, our history was originally in uh, carbon trading and carbon projects. So for sure, this is uh, an area we're interested in. I think at one point we were the largest uh, developer and owner of carbon projects in the world. Uh, back in the in the 90s. So definitely significant uh, institutional memory around this topic. I think after the global financial crash, the carbon markets more or less died <laughs> for a number of years. And so I think the opportunities there have been limited. But I think it's really encouraging to see that, that, you know, people are starting to talk about carbon again, and carbon projects, carbon credits. And again, there's been some very interesting innovations, things like the Peace Rec or the PREC, which is a renewable energy certificate, basically in exchange for a ton of carbon dioxide in uh, fragile states. So they're issuing them in places like Somalia, DRC, Sudan, uh, IREX, then you've got your traditional um, uh, VERs and CERs. So yeah, for sure, again, significant uh, innovation in a relatively short time in this space. And I definitely see some, some relevant applications of uh, carbon projects uh, in the region. Right. Thank you so much, Adam. We can see that uh, Camco Energy is really moving into the new areas and wanting to already contribute to these spaces. I can see that uh, our time is up, but there's one question online. Yeah, there's a question online and we'd like to just field it to you so that you can answer for our audience member before we release you. You can just put it up here and I can read it out. Okay, so we can see from Samuel Obonio, he's saying, what are the greatest challenges as far as the market infiltration of renewable energy? Uh, have we achieved zero carbon in the renewable energy sources? Do you have an answer for this, Adam? Yeah, so I think, um, I think we had a bit of a discussion on um, some of the progress, but for sure there have been some challenges. I think um, if I look at over the last five years, there's been significant work from uh, some of the uh, civil society groups and NGOs in improving the uh, business environment for renewables. 
So for example, with things like exemptions on VAT and import duties and all these things, because effectively, ultimately, that the, those duties and uh, import taxes, et cetera, are contributing to much higher costs uh, for these energy sources than would otherwise uh, be necessary. And we've seen some progress in that. I think um, for me, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we have, particularly in the grid space, is that innovation in the generation sector has massively uh, outpaced the um, rate of investment in transmission and distribution. Uh, now that's obviously a slightly generalized comment, but I think that's certainly a, a trend across the continent. You know, as uh, companies liberalize aspects of their power sector, you know, generation is typically the first one to be liberalized. And we've seen significant growth and, you know, uptake of solutions. But, you know, if, if the transmission and distribution grids are not sufficiently robust, you can't uh, just keep adding uh, renewables resources into the grid, particularly intermittent renewables such as solar and wind. And so, uh, you know, for me, one of the big challenges is how, how do we unlock additional investment into the transmission and distribution sector so that it can keep pace with some of these innovations going on in the generation space. And I think, um, you know, there are significant challenges around that. And I think it depends on what your political views are as to whether, you know, the, the transmission and distribution sector are areas in which the private sector should operate or not. But I think, um, you know, as a general point, we somehow, either through the public uh, or private means, need to get more investment into um, strengthening the transmission and distribution uh, grids so that it can accommodate greater penetration of renewables. Right. Thank you so much, Adam, for that. We need to see how to invest in distribution and transmission. I think that has been an area for, of uh, we need to focus on. There are also a lot of uh, losses that are uh, uh, seen in transmission and distribution. And that's a key area that we need to look at. So thank you so much, Adam, for being such a great sport and for educating us through answering our questions. Let's give a hearty hand clap. Thanks very much for having me and uh, enjoy the session. Yes, you're welcome to also join us. I can see the room is fuller and the clap is even bigger. The people on Mombasa time are here. <laughs>